Um, next up, uh, we're going to hear from Barney Krause, who is a soundscape ecologist. Um, unfortunately, uh, Barney can't be with us uh, today, um, but what I'm going to encourage you to do is a little bit unusual. Uh, the next bit is going to occur mainly in terms of a soundscape uh, that we're going to create here in the hall. Uh, so feel free, if you'd like to, to close your eyes for the next 15 minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Bernie Krauss, and I'm a soundscape ecologist. I'm sorry I can't join you in person today for this FFA conference, but please enjoy my introduction to this exciting new field and its incredible potential in the realm of agricultural resource management. You're listening to the voice of Sonoma Valley, about 80 kilometers north of San Francisco in California wine country. This is a healthy agricultural community featuring sustainable farming practices and wise use of water and harvesting. Not only is this visibly obvious, but the natural soundscape, the voice of this community, confirms its viability. In the next few minutes as a soundscape ecologist, I'm going to expand on the title of this event, a paraphrase of David Bowie's aphorism, with new perspectives. I studied natural sounds and our human impact as we shape our land and seascapes. I got into this field because, as Nietzsche once said, never trust a thought that occurred to you indoors. I'll begin with some background on the concept of sound, likely the least understood sense in our culture. After some definitions, then I'll show how deeply certain types of sound have informed us, from science to the humanities. And I'll show the influence of these perceptions on our understanding of natural phenomena. But first, the soundscape. The soundscape is all of the sound that reaches our ears from whatever source. And it's comprised of three basic sources of sound. The first is the geophony. Geophonies, non-biological natural sounds, were the first acoustic signals produced on Earth. They occurred as volcanic action and moving tectonic plates formed early topography. Geophonies still exist in the form of the effects of wind, waves at the ocean shore or in a stream, or the movement of the Earth. There was nothing to hear those signals until much later when they were joined by new layers of sound produced by biological organisms. Since all living organisms produce some kind of signal, those sounds were referred to as the biophony. Although we have no way to know for sure, since their fossil impressions are the only evidence we have of their existence, it's likely that rangemorphs that appeared off the coast of what's now Newfoundland some 550 million years ago were amongst the first organisms to generate some kind of signal through their metabolism. Biophonies are the collective sound produced by all organisms in a given habitat at one moment in time, like a dawn chorus of insects, frogs, birds, and mammals vocalizing in a healthy habitat. At one point during our early evolution, we were part of that chorus. Now, however, I've segmented humans out, and we have our own category, anthropophony. Anthropophony is comprised of all the sounds we humans produce, and it's divided into two subcategories, controlled sound like music, theater, and language, and incoherent or chaotic sound that we refer to as noise. When I think of noise, it suggests types of sound that convey no coherent or relevant information, at best only fragments. Very few of the sounds we now produce, whether controlled or incoherent, have any connection to our ancient acoustic roots, those of the natural world. And for that reason alone, I've set us apart. Recently, I've been thinking about the timelines of these three categories and have come up with this. Geophonies have been around now for over four and a half billion years, the entire lifespan of our planet. They were there at the beginning and they still exist, although in modified forms, because the topography, vegetation, and atmosphere has changed so radically over time. But here's the length of time for the biophony. Biophonies have been around for a bit over 12% of the Earth's lifetime, perhaps 550 million years now. At its peak, at the end of the last ice age, about 16,000 years ago, 
Millions of species thrived across a diverse planetary land and seascape. As far as we know, nearly every organism joined the biophonic chorus, and then there was us. In our short existence, our impact on millions of years of abundant life, not only from resource extraction, land transformation, but also from the noise we create, has been staggering. The addition of our catastrophic sound print has been most notably felt for just the past 250 years. Since the onset of the Industrial Revolution, a tiny fraction of the Earth's history. I had a hard time fitting it onto this pie chart because the industrial noise signature represents just one five millionth of one percent of the Earth's history. The soundscape ecology story can be told through the lens of any of these disciplines. In recent publications, I've expanded the subject to show how many are informed by natural soundscapes and how any one of us can get involved in this field from those perspectives. Music, for example, how animals taught us to dance and sing. Medicine, since I was a kid, I've suffered from a terrible case of attention deficit disorder, mitigated primarily by time spent in the wild, listening to natural soundscapes. Agriculture, how sustainable farming renders its own biophonic resonance. The recording of animal voices began with a bird-by-bird -bird model as early as 1889, when individual voices were abstracted from the larger biological soundscape. That paradigm dominates to this day in many institutions. But here's the problem. To me, that protocol is a bit like trying to describe the magnificence of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony by abstracting the voice of a single violin player out of the orchestra and hearing just that one part. Or... This orchestral full ensemble idea is the way the natural world expresses itself, holistically. The late John Cage once wrote that if we want to understand nature, we have to look and listen to her as she is. I will now show how these soundscapes can be used to evaluate the health of habitats because this has a direct link to agriculture. In this next series of examples, I'll show how spectrograms, graphic illustrations of sound, help us come immediately to terms with the consequences of a broad range of direct or indirect human activity. In these spectrograms, time is represented left to right on the x-axis, while frequency is shown on the y-axis from lowest to highest sounding signals covering the entire human hearing range. This is an example of a forest in Costa Rica before and after clear-cutting. The left-hand side of the screen represents a healthy forest biophony in the Osa Peninsula in 1990, prior to logging. You can see how sound is structured in a healthy habitat, with mammals, birds, and insects in clearly defined niches, and where we have the red-crowned woodpecker, common black hawk, ant birds, parakeet, flycatcher, howler monkeys, and insects. The right-hand side is what remains of the biophony in the same habitat seven years later, after clear-cutting. During the spring of 1988, a logging company in the High Sierra Mountains of California tried to convince local residents that there'd be no environmental impact from a new logging protocol that they were using called selective logging. With permission to record before and after the process, I captured the first sample on the summer solstice of 1988, followed a year later after the operation. The left hand of the slide shows a robust habitat with a stream signature in the bottom third of the image and a rich expression of birds in the middle section. The right hand side of the screen represents what remained after selective logging. You can see the signature of the stream in the bottom third, but note what's missing in the middle of the image.
I've returned 16 times in 30 years. The biophony has not yet been restored. The eye fools us. The left-hand photo was taken before selective logging in 1988. Compare that to the right-hand photo taken three years after, which still looks like a healthy habitat since not a tree looks out of place. However, in 15 seconds, the biophony tells a very different story. While a picture may be worth a thousand words, a soundscape is worth a thousand pictures. Sugarloaf Ridge State Park borders Napa and Sonoma Valleys in California. I've been recording there every spring since 1993 and watched how the spectrogram signified the effects of global warming. The 2004 example on the far left of the screen shows a normal year's biophony with a stream signature in the bottom third of the image and a diverse sample of birds in the middle. 2009, the second example, still shows the stream, but the bird density has begun to change due to spring occurring two weeks earlier than in 2004. 2014 shows the effects of the third year of drought. 2015 illustrates the fourth year of the drought with a nearly silent spring. This is the first time I've ever heard a silent spring. Emotional expression is not limited to humans. When a habitat is under stress, the pathology is conveyed through its voice, just like ours when we're sick. About seven years ago, a colleague was recording in a remote part of Minnesota at a small pond ecosystem formed by a beaver dam. With no human habitation anywhere nearby, it was isolated enough and free from noise, the reason he'd been recording there for many years. That day, while recording, a couple of game wardens suddenly appeared and dropped a stick of dynamite down into the beaver dam structure, killing the female and her young kids. Horrified, my colleague returned to the site and later that day captured the male beaver swimming in slow circles in what remained of his home, crying out inconsolably for its lost mate and offspring. This has got to be the saddest sound I've ever heard coming from any organism, human or other. In October 2017, my wife Catherine and I lost everything in the major firestorm that took out a thousand square kilometers of Napa and Sonoma. In a matter of a dozen days, the fires killed 43 people and damaged or destroyed an estimated 14,000 homes, 3,600 vehicles, and hundreds of businesses. The heat goes on. This is a post-fire shot of what's left of our studio and lab. Lost were 50 years of journals, all of my field slides and gear, and rare field equipment like all the transitional gear from analog to digital. Luckily I had five backups, three of which were destroyed. One copy had been transferred offshore earlier in 2017 to a safe house in Paris. I did it for protection from America's overt anti-science political climate, especially since some of this work had been government funded. The other copy was in a local bank, so the archive is safe. Well over 50% of this collection comes from habitats now completely silent or so radically altered that the biophony can no longer be heard in any of its original form. We're not speaking about individual species extinction here, we're talking about whole habitats. After all of the data have been collected and analyzed, after all the papers have been written and presented at conferences and read by six or seven colleagues, I've found that one of the best ways to convey this complex scientific information to larger audiences who need to know what we found is through the arts and humanities, my next step in this work. 
In the past few minutes, I've given a quick overview that represents the power of exploring soundscape ecology as a management tool. We can instantly tell from looking at the graphics generated from the audio recordings how well a particular habitat is thriving, whether it's rural or wild. I grew up in a world that typically assessed everything from what we see, but I've learned that a much fuller understanding can be realized from what we hear. Natural soundscapes are the signature voices of the natural world, and as we hear them, we're endowed with a more complete story of life and the world in which it exists. In a matter of seconds, a soundscape reveals much more information from many perspectives, from quantifiable data to cultural inspiration. Our ears know that the whisper of every leaf and creature cries out for us to pay careful attention, lest we still this divine expression at our own peril. Well, that was rather beautiful. <laughs>